Hey, hey there, Sunil. Welcome back to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. You are one of our earliest guests, and you've been back a few times since. And uh, also, you have been a participant in our, not every participant, time. but a, pre a presenter yes. in our Making Math Moments That Matter Summit. Is it every single I, time? I think, I I think every is. time. Yes. I think five, five, five years in a row. Five years in I a row. I love it. I love it. And there's always more to share. So the folks that go into the sessions, it seems like every time they're like, there's, you know, you would think it would be repetitive, but it's not. There's always something new going on. We're super excited to uh, chat with you here to kind of catch up, but then also to give folks a little bit of a glimpse into the future, because this Ooh. will be coming out <laughs> before the next uh, Making Math Moments That Matter Summit coming up in November. So Sunil, welcome back. What's going on in your world lately? How have you been? Oh, well, I mean, every time it seems like we come on, there's something that's happened recently, or I've been traveling. Uh, in this case, I was traveling. I, I You're going to like going on. Over for the first time. First, first time, uh, West Coast Canada, loved it. I was there Beautiful. for my niece's uh, engagement party, flew back, and then the very next day I flew to Austin to spend three days at the Number Lab, uh, mm. which is this really cool start up uh, these two people who've uh, exactly what it sounds like. Uh, when we think of a lab, we think of experimentation and sure. sort of understanding the, uh, especially in terms of chemistry, like the, 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 any, any of the properties of, of compounds, elements, how they interact, uh, and being very sort of mindful of, you know, terminology. And the same thing with mathematics, like how do how do numbers interact? Like, you know, when we multiply add and things like that, it's, it's, it was, it was a great experience. And, uh, you know, um, I'm sure I can uh, share that maybe next time I come on, but what I want to talk about, which is maybe strangely is, is actually the summit and my idea. Uh, and I haven't really settled on this, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to do this. And then we can sort of work backwards or talk about what's swirling around that is the idea of, of, of language, uh, of mathematics. And we, we talk about this all the time, like mathematics as a language. And I and I have thought about this a great deal because I don't think we do it the service in terms of the way we think about language in general. Well, first of all, you know, mathematics is the language of the universe. That's thrown around quite a bit. Yeah, okay. yeah, we hear that. That's a, heavy, that's a heavy one right there in terms of just the way the universe operates. Okay, now if you go come back down to earth and we talk about language and especially let's, let's look at mathematics as a second language. Okay. Um, so the same way we adopt a language of language fluency. Uh, and I did this actually at OME when I met you guys, that was my uh, part of my presentation. I, I, sh I shared a clip of Jodie Foster speaking French. Most people don't know Jodie Foster speaks fluent French. Mm. Now why I showed this clip is because when she's speaking, She's always smiling. There's a lightness about her in terms of sure. anticipating the question. She knows the nuance of the language. She's very relaxed. She's excited about the question. She shares her answer like, with confidence. Don't we want that same kind of language acquisition mm. for mathematics? Makes sense. Makes sense. I like right. it. I like it. Right? I like it. And it's if, like, if, if you're going to talk about mathematics as a language, then you must compare it to languages we you know, that we speak and that what it doesn't mean, like, are we just memorizing enough phrases to hang out in Paris for a weekend? And and it's, right. it's functional language. That's a, that's a really low bar. Mm, that's, that's a really low bar. Yeah. All, all you, we you, do, right. You're making all, all, me sad, Sunil, because yeah. uh, I can't he, do that in Paris with my French and I wish I could. I just got <laughs> back from a trip to Italy and, you know, I think, think about, Think about that. I, I learned zero Italian to go there. And, and, you know, and, and you're right. Like, it's like you go there and you're like, okay, I'm going to be able to like get by, you know, and I'm hoping that they can speak my language. And that's, yes. and that's kind of like in, in the same, put that, put that spin on that with mathematics. It's like, we're in the mathematics, you know, realm and we want to be able to speak fluently, but everyone's hoping they speak their language and not mathematics. Mm. And, you know, I'm glad you shared your experience in Italy because, I mean, I, I'm sure I've been guilty of it. Uh, I mean, I lived a whole year in Switzerland. I didn't pick up any German, Italian, or French. Uh, 
And I look back, I, I go, I wonder what my experience might have been. Uh, and I lived in the French part. I lived in Lausanne, Switzerland, so the French part. I wonder what my experience would have been if I even picked up some of the language. Like would I had maybe uh, better conversations with people I interacted with, as opposed to them interacting with me based on my English and their limited English. And it's the same, same old, but here's someone who seems he wants to be a learner. He's going to make mistakes, but he's trying. And he's interested in the language. He's interested in learning about it. I mean, the parallels are all there. Mm -hmm. And we just collectively, maybe because it's how we view mathematics and its purpose, it is pretty utilitarian and, and has, you know, can be a Clydesdale horse in terms of application. I get that. But if you look at, and again, I'll, I'll share that video of Jody Foster because it is so perfect. But if we look at what high level of language uh, acquisition looks like, you, you, you speak it fluently, that's one thing, but you're also aware of the, of the culture that the language sits in. You're maybe aware of its history. There's a lot of nuances which get folded in when you learn language that high. I'm not saying that we're gonna necessarily get there. What I'm saying is that we haven't even set the bar for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What what and is it? Think, yeah. So so think about this as like a you know a, a big a big lesson that you want to you want to teach teachers in 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 say this particular summit session. Yeah. And and if we think about mathematics as a language and think about the different you know things that we have to consider when learning a second language and how do we you know how do we speak that fluently? Right. What what would you say is like? you know, an important aspect that a, a person who's in the summit session yeah. going to be pulling out of this. I mean, like, let's get this idea. You've got this yeah. idea. It makes sense. We want it. Like what we've got these pieces to consider that we've got all these kind of things that are kind of are surrounding, yeah. you know, mathematics. What, what can I put in a, in a, in a, in a practice today? Or how do I, how do I think about that in terms of my classroom? Well, it, it's going to uh, start again. If you look at language, it's, and right now we talk about fluency. Uh, fluency is everywhere. So fluency is part of language. And so what I've done is I've already broken it down uh, into five pillars of fluency. Now we normally, normally, I think we only talk about factual, procedural, and conceptual. We, we kind of cap off at conceptual, but the two fluencies, and so what I'll do is I'll go through the, our familiar fluencies, you know, even factual fluency, which teachers will agree, but I'll even say there, like, I mean, what we spend a lot of time talking about uh, factual fluency, but my, my pushback will be, which facts are we saying are important? Because you are saying certain facts are more important than others. We need to have a factual fluency. Uh, for example, Okay, six times seven is a math fact. Sure, it's equal to 42. But I would argue that knowing that two times three times seven equals 42 is more important because you can build your own family of math facts. If you pull out one number, take out the three, two times seven is 14, put the three back in, 14 times three has to equal 42 now. Now, who's going to know their 14 times table? But th to break down numbers into their primes and to establish your fluency, factual fluency into that is more important than just knowing your times tables. Right. It, it just is. So it's going to start with the familiar, then we'll go into some procedural fluency and conceptual fluency. But the two ones which I'll add, which are the ones which people do exhibit in other areas, is um, what is your uh, contemporary fluency like with mathematics? Like, do you know what's going on in the world of mathematics? Do you know how many unsolved problems there are in mathematics, like over a thousand? Uh, and if which ones, if were to be solved, would maybe uh, affect the lives of you and your students? Right. Like we, we science teachers generally know what's going on in the world of science. Uh, English teachers are well read. They are always looking for new books, updating their curriculum True. in terms True. of content with new books. We never in do terms this. of how things have changed. I mean, when I went to high school, I mean everything was through the canon of sort of white, uh, you know, sure. Euro centric authors. I mean, Shakespeare is Shakespeare and Shakespeare is great, but <laughs> there wasn't a person of color author in 1981-82 that I'd read. Right. No. But now we've updated it. We There's there's a lot of great books out there, uh, especially which kids would be interested in. So again, is it, uh, 
I got, I just want to jump jump into here because I was like, oh. I like I like this thought. I like this thought about like this contemporary fluency. But is is it because do you think like the contemporary mathematics is because you know th the contemporary mathematics feels like it's up here, like it's it's at the university level, and therefore we can't access it in a way that would be meaningful to us. And that's kind of why this contemporary mathematics is not on par or we're behind in a way compared to say language and, and, and you know, and reading and writing and, and, and the English teachers and language teachers updating their curriculums to be modern science teachers probably are like, yeah, we can, we can update some of it over here. That makes sense. But math is just like, is it because it's way up there or is there a way for us to access it? Like we just talked with Conrad Wolfram and he was, you know, he was talking about specifically like computers could be a, a way for us to access that higher level thinking. Like there's no reason. I, I really liked his like his his thought that there was really no reason that elementary students can't be accessing calculus ideas because their ideas are very simple in, in a way. It's just the algebra that's prevented us from actually accessing it and in thinking about it because we all think that we have to be really fluent with the algebra before we can even experiment with calculus ideas, even though, you know, the idea of a limit on uh, the rate of rate of rate of change is there along, you know, early, early in our, in our journeys. But, you know, is it, is it, is, is AI or, or is, is technology the answer that we can get up here and be more contemporary or is, is it something that we're maybe never going to be able to access? I think you're, I think you're at least partially right in terms of the perception of that contemporary fluency swirls around post-secondary. I think that's definitely something, uh, and which I think is, is also true, but it's also uh, false. And what I mean by that, and I did this at the number lab, so I can bring back that in. And I was talking to teachers uh, that, you know, uh, we're talk I was talking about prime numbers and because uh, we did some activities around prime numbers. And it's talking about the Riemann hypothesis, which is about just generally about the distribution of prime numbers. Now, I, I don't even understand the Riemann hypothesis. I have, I, I mean, even people who go all the way to university, you have to take a very specific branch of mathematics to fully, fully understand it. All you need to know is it's, gen it's just generally about the distribution of primes. And I told them, I go, look, it's probably not going to be solved in my lifetime, but I've told my kids that one day, someone's going to solve something called the Riemann's hypothesis. It might not even be in your lifetime because it takes a long time sometimes, you know, look at for, uh, Fermat's last theorem, 352 years. But when it does get solved, it'll make the front page of every newspaper or online thing because of how important it is. Because, and the one I put it right to teachers who are in the room, most of them were elementary, middle school. I said, if you were to put, uh, multiply two, 200 digit numbers into a supercomputer. Like here's two 200 digit numbers, put in a supercomputer, how long would it take? Okay, fraction of a second. Take that answer and just for narrative purposes, stick, stick that answer into another supercomputer and ask that supercomputer to find the two primes, oh sorry, these two 200 digit numbers or prime numbers. Ask that supercomputer which uh, prime numbers built the answer you got. And I know that I've done this before, but some teachers think, oh, it'll take maybe longer, five, 10 minutes. It'll actually take a billion years. And that's good because if it took any shorter than our, 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 our banks, any financial transactions would be uh, at risk because they're all encrypted with that kind of thinking. So the, the, the actual mathematics, you don't have to fully understand. You have to fully understand the implications sometimes. And in science, I mean, the web telescope, I mean, yeah, you can see the web telescope and share it. But again, the mathematics of the web telescope, how it was built and how it, you know, gets the images is really complicated. Sure. So I think we haven't even had the discussion, which I think is so important as to why does this knowledge sit up here and can it be brought down? And that's only being brought down, not for full understanding, but for curiosity. That's the mm. whole point. It's, it's to foster the curiosity to continue to learn this language through this fluency, uh, contemporary fluency. Right, right. Now, you know, I'm listening and I'm nodding and I see John's nodding as well. And I'm sure everyone listening at home is going, yeah, like we want, we need more of this in our math classrooms. And then, you know, I'm going to do the whole, you oh, know, record. I know where you're going. I know where you're going. 
we're going to do the screech here and we're going to throw this at you. And the reality is, is like, I'm going to be the typical teacher because my wife is still in the classroom. I'm no longer in the classroom myself, but she's going to say, you know, that would be awesome. But like, how do I go about that? And we always like try to find like, like, how can I, as an educator, and I want, I want to sort of paint a picture here of like, you know, let, let's picture elementary for a second where, you know, I've got to teach all these different subject areas. I need to essentially, at least in this, the minds of my students, I need to be a subject specialist, you know, in that grade level for all of these subject areas. And like, how, how can I get started on this journey to, you know, again, it's not going to be just overnight, right? We know this, like change takes time, but like, you know, Sunil, if you're there and you're, you know, you could sit and and be on the shoulder of an educator who's like, I do want to take a step in that direction. Like, I, I agree with what Sunil's saying here fundamentally, but like, what does that look like and sound like for me in a way that is going to feel um, like I'm actually making a difference, like I'm shifting in that direction and doing something positive to, to get towards this end goal? Well, and I think the what you actually said to me is the first goal is that would we collectively generally agree that curiosity and this definition of fluency and all that, this is something I wish I could do if I had the time, resources. That's the first, that's so critical because I've said this before, I think I might have said it in the debate map podcast. Um, that to me is a victory because the teacher wants it. Yeah. And you're also tempered by their reality that, oh, I'm just swamped with a whole bunch of other stuff which I have to do. So the fact that this sits beside the teacher going, yeah, absolutely. So, because that's the that's the first buy-in. Like teachers, uh, good or for bad, are gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. They're very the gatekeepers. True. We are the they're gatekeepers. They're the gatekeepers and their intentions generally are very good. Even the most stoic, you know, uh, analog teacher, whatever you want to do, their intentions are always the best for students. This is the important thing that it, it's not us versus them. It's like, okay, we all want the best for students. Agree. That's right. our starting point. We all do. And then what does that mean best? Does it mean high test scores or does it mean more of a richer mathematical experience to engender and nurture curiosity. So going back to your question, that teacher is going, yeah, I would love to, you know, well, then you have to think about Trojan horse moments. Right. Where can I bring this in that's aligned to my curriculum that's already there? And right. I'll give you a very simple example, very simple example that you can, teachers could do, like, uh, I mean, I, I'd say middle school, but even, I mean, lower. So for example, I, and I did this at the number lab in Austin. It was my first question. I was closing the session out on the Thursday, last Thursday. And I wrote, and I said, just using a two, one, two, and one, three. I don't wanna see anything else. I don't wanna see uh, any other numbers. I don't wanna see the, the two used twice or the three used. Three. I wanna see one, two, one, three only. With only one, two, and one, three, can you make a question in which the answer is 16? Now, right away, there's a conflict because the, it's so simple in terms of, uh, I don't know, you can't use it to, no. They know that the, two of the exponent three is eight and every teacher knew that. So they were wrestling with the idea that, uh, and it's binary, you either know it or you don't. You, it would take years for you to figure it out, which is fine in a different universe, but I created that tension right away. And I, it was tension, a little bit of anxiety, but the curiosity was battling with the anxiety. Even though nobody knew the answer, few were going to let me leave without knowing the answer. Mm -hmm. So what we've learned, you know, we've learned addition, multiplication, and then exponentiation. And that's just, the, that's where the knowledge stopped. We didn't, we just assumed that the whole iteration cycle stopped at exponentiation. It doesn't. So if you write the three, on the left-hand side in superscript, so it looks kind of weird, like a mirror image. That answer is 16. Now, why is it 16? Is because now that three 
is giving instructions to two, duplicate yourself three times, so write a tower of three twos. Mm -hmm. So just like exponentiation is the iteration of multiplication, this thing called tetration is the iteration of exponentiation. So mm -hmm. you write these three twos in a tower, so two to the exponent two is four, and then two to the exponent four is 16. Mm -hmm. And it was that, and these were mo almost all elementary and middle school teachers. And I was there in that moment when I shared, that's what you do. And like, they were like elated, excited to learn this new, like in the big scheme of things, it, it's, it's, it's a piece of insignificant factual fluency information, but because it challenged their beliefs of what they, that should be, that's it. And it keeps going around. So there are so many moments as a, Trojan horse, at least to bring in, which is aligned to the curriculum, and you know, I, I'll I'll share some of those things, you know, obviously. Uh, when I, yeah. Uh, my, the well, song. yeah, like like when you when you think about when you said the gate gatekeepers of knowledge is that you know teachers teachers do this. It, it is a complex situation, like you said, like so many things on a teacher's plate, and, and that is it's unbelievable how many things you know they're asked to do, and, and we're asked to do every single single day. So asking them to do something else for sure feels like I can't do something else. But I think what, the way that it needs to happen is what I think what you're trying to say as well is that that teacher themselves have to be inspired to be like I'm going to bring this in, and I'm going to teach through this lens. And that's how I'm going to, you know, share these stories in, in, a, in a way. It's like, I thought about this, about your, your analogy about fluency in a language is like, are the teachers, the translators, like they're, they're, they're translating this language between this to this other language and the language that students are experiencing. But the problem, right. You know, that imagine a translator who just doesn't know the language well enough. And all of a sudden, what's coming out the other side mm -hmm. is that bare bones. We, you know, this is this is the way we taught for a long time. Is that we teach the naked problems because we're trying to get kids, like what you said, there's so many good intentions, but it's like we don't see the beauty. We don't really understand that stuff. You know, the mathematics at that deep level ourselves because we were translated from teachers who also didn't know it. So it's like it's been passed down. <laughs> All these, all this translation has been in, in mathematics has been lost, you know, in this translation in a way, right? Like this beauty has been been passed down to down. We continually do this to students, but it, but you know, you get a good translator when a teacher brings these storytelling elements into play, brings the mathematics into play for the students to grapple with because you're teaching through this lens of contemporary math or through the beauty of math or through number sense and in, in, yeah. in, in, in actual mathematics and actual fluency. So I don't know. What do you think? Like, is, is, are we translators or are we, are we playing a different role in this like language of mathematics? I love that explanation. I think that explains kind of the general art history of math education really well is that, and not we were looking at, we were being translators, but that's what we were doing. Like, and I'll give you a perfect example. I mean, uh, it took me 10 years of teaching calculus to understand calculus. I mean, my grade 13 mark, uh, like 94, 93, I can't remember. In calculus, <laughs> I was a fraud. Come sure. On, yeah. Me on. as well. Right? That's You were the that's Google a, translator. You were like, was, you, you, you were so, like, I'm going to, I'm just going to like mimic was, this. I was I was a really good Google translator, and the the scary part was at that time, um, even though, yeah, I was aping procedures and okay that question I do that I think I must have convinced myself I was doing mathematics. I'm pretty sure I thought, hey, I'm the you know cat's meow or the bee's knees or whatever. Like this is yes, Neil's pretty good at math, and. Uh, I got a little bit of a rude awakening in university, but I luckily I had a good mentor, Peter Harrison. Other he challenged me in terms of, you know, uh, and I, I I think that epiphany revelation in terms of, wow, I don't think I fully understand what's going on in the world of calculus at least, and I'm going to try to understand it better and I'm not going to put a stopwatch on it. And that goes back to the T this is why I get frustrated with math education because I'm not asking teachers to have 
swallow whole boxes of knowledge. I'm just asking you to be curious for it. That your journey starts with, okay, go, I'm curious now. And there is, and in fact, the more open-endedness of the question you, you share, in which a, question, a student might go, well, how did they do that back then in 12, 20, how'd they do that? And you go, hmm, and they're going to look it up. There, you want to create as many scavenger hunters as possible. That's really, I think, the role of, a, of, of especially a math teacher is to create a community of people who are going to chase down ideas and bring it back to a classroom and, oh, yeah, I'm confused too. And that was the other thing too, which I share. This is really important is that the, the emotions that we associate negatively with mathematics, like confusion, lost, being bewildered, perplexed, these are not negative emotions. These are the real, if you don't have these reactions to mathematics, you're not doing mathematics because the entire thematic development of mathematics has been about being lost, confused. I don't know what we're doing. Oh, we, we, we messed up. Let's do, that, that's it. And because kids don't know this history or the teachers, why do you think anxiety exists? Because they think they're supposed to be right every single minute. And they'd be far more relaxed if they knew that, what? And, and I think I've talked about this in previous podcasts, everything that students learn, every single thing they learn at some point, if you were to build a time machine, keep going back, there'd be a point at which that piece of knowledge they're learning wasn't known or poorly understood. Like this is it. This, there are the kids are time travelers, and so yeah, I love the idea. But it, it's I think it's a lost in translation kind of situation. Mm -hmm. I now you know I'm still I, I'm still sort of like as as an educator and as you know someone who's listening. It's like what what can we how, how can we I mean, being aware of it, I think is so key, right? Like that's the first yeah. step, right? Knowing that there's a problem, that's the first yeah. step. And then, you know, how do we, how do we strengthen, like, how do we make ourselves more aware of like what's going on around us so that we can actually do it? Cause you said something earlier that I a hundred percent envision this as me. And I remember as a teacher, I taught data management for a very long time and in my first year as a grade 12 data management teacher, which wasn't calculus, but it was still like, you know, I remember going through that course and thinking like, oh, yeah. wow, I really love this stuff. <laughs> but it wasn't until like five or six times through that I was like, oh, like that's how to make that awesome, you know? Yeah. So like, how do we, you know, how, how do you do this in such a way? Because again, it's like, if we're waiting for every educator to get 10 reps in, 10 years in, 20 years in, before they start to like see the quote unquote light, hmm. you know, like this is going to take us a really long time for us to take and make a true dent in what it is that we're actually trying to, you know, envision here in, in trying to make math class more about real math than say school math. And I think that, you know, we... I think you might have brought this up in a previous podcast in terms of just how do we shrink that uh, timeline without kind of uh, doing a disservice to the organic uh, acquisition language of mathematics. Uh, and I think, uh, first of all, hitting a pause button that, you know, do you have discussions with your students in terms of not like, hey, how do we feel about that topic? Like, what is the, do you have the pulse of your classroom about their attitudes towards mathematics? Now you, I'm guessing teachers do, they say, ah, most kids probably don't like math, but I don't think they're allowing that question to sit in the classroom because it's gonna sting. And it's not gonna be a personal indictment on you. You know, we're just collectively just delivering the system. But I think part of this discussion has to occur with students like in terms of like what would make mathematics more interesting? Like, well, it, it, ask them. <laughs> and there might be some overlap in some of the answers we've been sharing. But I think we need to have a lar long enough pause button to go, okay, yeah, I wish we had sort of more curiosity in mathematics, a little bit more contemporary stuff coming in. Uh, then, you know, finding moments to put it in and maybe finding colleagues to work with like it starts in your own classroom it starts sure. with an individual teacher uh it starts with you because i don't know the makeup of your kids their their yeah. backgrounds and you know it, it, 
but having said that, uh, I'm going to say this too. I think I've, uh, is that when I was uh, in San Jose last year, I gave a keynote for Silicon Valley Education Foundation, but the day before I spent a whole day in a juvenile detention center. Okay, And most of these kids were like uh, uh, teenage boys, Latino. A lot of them had gang affiliations. And uh, now I didn't go in and do mathematics that was, uh, uh, could have been around their culture or their experiences. This, this is why I get ir uh, angry in math education. Every student deserves high quality mathematics. And the mathematics I did was I did some number theory and you know the birthday game. And every and I wrote a whole blog about that. And, and I have a witness, uh, Bernadette, uh, Sally Greeno, who was the new president of California Math Council, she was there for the whole time. These kids all left smiling. Now, these kids are in a juvenile detention center going back to their two and a half, three inch mattresses, and they only have library time 30 minutes per week. But temporarily for 30, 40 minutes, mathematics, the mathematics I did, elevated them to a space where they forgot about where they were. They had no reason to, to respond that way because of their current situation. But mathematics has a history of doing this. It, it, it elevates people from their current situation mm -hmm. as bleak as it is temporarily. And again, why did it work? Fine. A little bit has to do with presentation and personality. I'm not going to push back on that. But a lot of it had to do with the mathematics. The sure. mathematics is the star of the show. I think I think so. And, and, and the way that we view it, and, and this is you know, when you're talking about like, how does a teacher, you know, do this in the class, but also get inspired enough to want to bring it in? Because that's, that's, that's where we're at in a sense. Like when I said before is, and you said before is that there's so much going on. A teacher has to say, I want to bring this into my classroom to teach through, through this. And, you know, I think where we have, and, and I know you, what you're saying here too, is, is where you're, we're seeing gains uh, with students, you know, smiling around mathematics and under, you know, going, I want to know more is when we create what we've been, you know, we've been saying was math epiphanies. Like where, yeah. where are these epiphanies that people are having around mathematics? And they were like, oh, like I didn't, like, like you said at the beginning of this podcast was like mystery, you know, it's, it's built in mystery. So it's like how many how many math epiphanies can we make? You know, when we're talking with our district leaders and our district improvement program, one of our stages is about how do we do this on a regular basis? Because when you create a math epiphany for a teacher, they will, and, and they, they're like, oh my God, like it's a, it's a shocking moment for them. They want to repeat that for their students. And that's like a way for them to get in. And it is all mathematics. Like you're saying, it is all content driven to, to grapple with the behaviors of the mathematics in it, in its uh, oh my gosh moment that we can do, and if we can do more of that, then teachers will, you know, naturally say, "I want to do more of that in my classroom." So it's it's like when we try to say inspire teachers to say grapple or grab mathematics by the horns and say, "I'm going to bring this in," because you know that the curriculum is out there, and you most a lot of teachers are just following it page by page. We know that you know. All of these standards are listed and it feels overwhelming when we look at all of this. We have to cover all of this this year. It's it's little math epiphanies one at a time is it actually I think the the actual what do you, the the snowball effect will will eventually happen because we can create more epiphanies, but it is through content. It's not through pedagogy. It's not through some of these other pieces. It's it's all it's all content. Now, Sunil, I want to toss one more question here at you, which is in the session that you're, you know, you're going to do at the summit coming up in November, what would you say is one big takeaway you hope to give, say, the participant who shows up to that session? Like, what's the one thing you will hope they leave their session with that day? I mean, it sounds simple, but, you know, we want simple solutions, simple beginnings. Sure. But one thing that I would like every teacher to take away uh, is that they themselves are now more excited about mathematics than prior to coming in. That they, whatever level of interest, curiosity, 
elementary, middle school, high school teacher, whatever it is you came in. You maybe even came in already excited. But even that teacher, I want them to feel more excited. And the reason why I want this to be a universal thing is that you have to, and I will convey this, is that you have to understand that there is no end point in learning anything in life, especially mathematics. And that you must be a lifelong learner first before a lifelong teacher. That eclipses sure. your teaching. So 100%. that would be my takeaway that, wow, there's, I, I feel more curious and excited about being a teacher of mathematics. Mm. That, that reaction emotion is the emo is the takeaway that I want. I love that. And as a mathematics teacher myself, and we've talked about it on the podcast, and I think all three of us can relate that very quickly, if we aren't trying to find those ways to stay curious, to learn something new, to get excited, it becomes a very hard career and it, and it, and it shows, right. And, it, and we wonder why our students don't respond positively to maybe coming to class or coming to, you know, learn about mathematics as, you know, if we're up there and it's the same thing, the same boring thing as it was in year one of my teaching, as it is in year five, as it is in year 15, as it is in year 30, it's going to just get harder and harder, both for you and for the students. And we lose that opportunity. So, you know, through this conversation and through many of the conversations we've had in the past, and I'll always walk, aw walk away with some really great thoughts, um, perspectives that we can put not only into our math teaching, but also other areas of our life. Because I, I think this is not something that stops in mathematics. It's in every aspect of life. There's so much to learn. There's so much to know. There's so much exciting things going on that we can take advantage of. We just have to look for them, right? Keep our eyes open. So thanks so much, Air Sunil, for being a part of the podcast and for being a part of the summit coming up in November. Friends, if you head over to makemathmoments.com forward slash summit, you can sign up for the free live virtual summit. And uh, hey, make sure that you click yes on Sunil's session because I'm sure it's going to be a good one. Thanks a ton there, Sunil. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, John. Thank you.